Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sheka. Sheka. Come on up, Raj Kamars. Join us. Yeah, come join us. One of us. They were on vacation. On vacation now. Look, there's two seats right here in the very front. Look at that right here, right here, right there. Don't sit on my glasses, but yeah. Scoot over one. Let your husband sit on the other. There you go. Yeah, nice purse, Chris. <laughs> Holly matches your matches your your bracelet. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> so this is our second week ha, of our uh, 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 burning room teaching on uh, what we're doing here and where we're going. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first week, uh, or for the first time, uh, first week's message is online. You can pick that up, check it out. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about the history of, our, uh, of this uh, meeting. <clears throat> it's very good in here right now. I hope you stay connected to Jesus in here. We talked briefly about the uh, history of this meeting and how it's always been part of our house and how that's always been God's plan for it to be part of our house. And then we talked uh, about uh, the, the scriptures that are kind of um, our overview of what we're doing here. And we talked about how our scriptures were uh, broken into three groups of how we're supposed to pray what we're supposed to pray, and what we're supposed to expect. Last week, we talked about how we pray, and, uh, and uh, just basically, uh, you want to check that teaching out, but we pray together, we pray in unity. Uh, we're supposed to be in unity, we're supposed to be in the Spirit. We're not supposed to say a bunch of vain words, repeating things over and over again, thinking that God rewards, ha, ah, rewards just vain repetition, as the Word says, uh, but we're supposed to pray from the heart. Um, we don't criticize any other prayer ministry that has a different uh, model than what we believe God has shown us. Uh, just like they're doing what God has shown them, we have to do what God has shown us. Amen? You really can't imitate your way into God's pleasure, right? You have to react to what he's put in your heart. And if he hasn't put something in your heart, get, meet him and um, do what he puts in your heart. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Meeting him is the, is the first step in that. Hallelujah. And so uh, tonight uh, we're going to talk about uh, what to pray. But first I want to kind of talk very briefly about um, the, the, just a little history context of uh, prayer rooms in general uh, and kind of what we're doing. Uh, we're not the first people who ever had a prayer meeting at a church. Believe, believe it or not, this actually began... At the beginning of the church, not the church, Revival Life Church, but the big C Church of Jesus Christ. A lot of people like to talk about the prayer movement, and I'm, I'm part of the prayer movement. I hope you are too, because it started in the book of Acts uh, at a prayer meeting when the Holy Spirit was sent. And the Holy Spirit was sent in a prayer meeting. Amen? And that's got to mean something. That's, that's probably significant. Right? So we don't have to tarry like the saints of old tarry for the sending of the Spirit because He's already been sent. He's already been sent. We don't have to tarry for the Spirit to be sent. I understand that makes people feel like they're accomplishing something and they're uh, achieving some sort of biblical uh, thing uh, because Jesus said, wait. But if you're going to do that, then you biblically have to be waiting in Jerusalem. If you want to follow the Scripture to tarry for the Spirit, then you actually would have to be in Jerusalem waiting for it, right? Because like, that's what Jesus actually said. But in, in, in with all of Christianity, we like to do biblical hopscotch. And we take a little bit of this covenant and a little bit of that covenant and a little bit of David's promise and mix it a little bit of that promise and then just claim it all for me. And then we get mad at God that it doesn't work out. Right? Like I have no clue why people keep wanting to quote the old covenant. I don't want any of the requirements of the old covenant. I don't know about you. But that stuff wasn't free back then. Now it's free. Back then it wasn't free. It cost a lot. And the price we're messing up was, was high. Why anybody would want that covenant, I don't know. I don't want anything to do with that covenant. There's nothing in that covenant for me. My covenant is better in every way. 
right? It, it, there, there is no, there's no way, in no fashion, with no measurement, is the old covenant better than the new covenant. Jesus said, hey, you know, hey, we, I send this new wine to you. They're like, well, normally it's old and then the new, right? Because that's how the old covenant and then the new covenant. He was like, yeah, but you come in now, you get good stuff now. That's what I want now. Good stuff now. I don't want old stuff. I want to dig up old problems. I want now. Amen? I like new stuff. How about you? I like new socks. I like new underwear, right? Like I like to just buy all new stuff and throw away all the old stuff. I don't know some of y'all wait till it gets all ratty and falls apart. I just like to. Socks are just not that expensive, right? I like to just buy like three dozen pairs of socks and just throw away all my old socks. Then they all match. I don't know, it's revolutionary, right? Am I blowing minds right now or what? Just throw them all away and buy new socks. You got them ones that look like they're surfing. They got the waves going through them. Fall down into your shoe while you're wearing them. I want new. Amen? I want new. I want the new. I don't want the old. I want the new. And so <clears throat> there's been, um, as, you, as you look back through church history, there's been prayer movements that have happened over time uh, with various biblical accuracy. Um, the, 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 the Catholics, you know, they have a history of, of having uh, monks who prayed for long periods of time, but um, we're not really going to go through that as much because uh, we're not really trying to accomplish exactly what they were trying to accomplish. So we're going to start with the Moravians. I don't know if you've heard of the Moravians. The, the Moravians, um, they were a group of Protestant, German Protestants, right? And they were being um, Moravians. And they were being <laughs> persecuted by the, um, by the Catholics. And they really believed that, like, we should believe the New Testament, Right? They believe that we should have a heart of service, that, uh, that, that we should be uh, really believing God uh, in faith to do miraculous things. Uh, and um, the Catholics weren't as excited about that doctrine, and they were, being, um, they were being persecuted by the Catholics. And so they left where they were, and they um, wound up uh, a, on a plot of land owned by a dude named, anybody know his name? Count Zinzendorf. Zinzendorf. Thank you. So in the early 1700s, John, a man named John Huss was, was a preacher of righteousness, right? And his followers were these people called the Moravians. And um, they, they fled from, they began in what's it's modern um, Czech Republic, basically, where they were. They fled uh, into uh, what's now Germany, um, and they went on to a plot of land owned by a very wealthy man named Count Zinzendorf, right? And he had bought his grandmother's estate after she passed, and uh, they were looking for a place to live. He let them live. And because of their persecution, because of the persecution they were, they were undergoing and uh, how they were being uh, just um, uh, murdered by the, the Catholics, uh, they went to prayer to, for God's protection over them. And they were so pious in heart that Zinzendorf, uh, he had always, he had dedicated his, his life to the Lord when he was like five or, or eight. And he had a heart after God, and he rededicated himself several times to the Lord. And he was so um, moved by their prayer and, and their fervency in prayer, he decided to, to um, give them a very large plot of land so that they could start their own community. And so the Moravians um, began this community based on what they considered a New Testament uh, uh, practices, and, and in, 18, 20, in 1727, they started a prayer meeting, and this prayer meeting wound up lasting a hundred years, night and day, and they stayed in this, this, this prayer meeting, uh, praying for God's protection originally, but then just praying for God's grace, His presence, they just prayed for Jesus to come, and this, these are the first people, uh, this is the beginning of the, of the modern missionary Movement. Before this, uh, the Catholics would send a priest somewhere to maybe start a mission. Uh, the, the Moravians, because of them meeting Jesus in prayer, their heart for the lost, it would overwhelm them. And so they began sending out missionaries. Now, in 1735, this is like eight years later, 1735, 36, right about there. This is like eight, nine years after their night and day prayer meeting went uh, they were on, there was a group of Moravians on a ship coming to the United States. On that same ship was John and Charles Wesley. Now, John Wesley was an Anglican missionary to the United States, uh, but he hadn't actually been converted yet uh, by his own testimony. 
right? And so at one point, um, they hit a storm, and the storm cracked the mast in half. It fell and broke the bow of the ship, and water began gushing in, and people were losing their minds, right? Because they figured they were about to die, except for the Moravians. And the Moravians, their, their entire affect did not change. They continued, they continued in worship. They continued in prayer. And in John Wesley's, um, in, uh, John Wesley's journal, uh, he wrote this. He goes, that they were having a little service on deck when the mast broke and broke the ship, right? And in the midst of the psalm, they were reading a psalm at the time, in the midst of the psalm wherewith their service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between, uh, excuse me, waves covered the ship and poured in between the decks, as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English, the people who spoke English. The Germans, who were the Moravians, the Germans calmly sang on. I asked one of them afterwards, were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. I asked, but were not your women or children afraid? He smiled mildly. No, our women and children are not afraid to die. These people had encountered Jesus, and they had an assurance of a life after death. And they were convinced. And so as these Moravians were on the ship, John Wesley would write about them that they, the entire sailing, would serve the other passengers. And sometimes the passengers would want to pay them for it, and they would take no money. And other times, passengers would beat them for it. Like, get away from me, you weirdo. They would punch them, they would slap them, and they said their affect never changed. They never, they never were downcast. This was just their service to the Lord. And they said that they would serve other people because it, it helped them with the pride of their heart. This is... This is, this is eight, nine years into this prayer meeting. They're already sending missionaries to the United States, like families, right? We're talking the 1730s, right? And so by 1791, this was like 65 years after they started the prayer meeting, they'd already sent 300 missionaries to the ends of the earth. Around the same time, they established a mission in Jamaica, and they had water baptized almost a third of the entire island. This was what came out of that, that prayer meeting. And so <clears throat> later on, uh, at the prayer meeting ended, and uh, they just started getting religious, sadly, which happens with so many moves of God. But Charles Wesley, excuse me, John and Charles Wesley, they carried that anointing and started the Methodist revival with the circuit riders and, and, just, and, and the great awakening that came through the United States through the anointing that he picked up through these people. As he got back to uh, England after he left America, he, he stayed with the Moravians to learn what they had that he didn't have. And it turned out to be saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And after he was converted and he felt the Holy Spirit fill him is when he began changing the world. So <clears throat> over the years, uh, you know, that ended in the uh, 1800s. And over the years, there's been prayer movements. And, and like the next major one that we would identify with started in the 1970s uh, by a man named uh, Young E. Cho. Now, David Young E. Cho at one time had the largest church in the world in South Korea. It was a small, it was a small group-based church um, where David Young E. Cho. Uh, and he, um, it's so funny. <laughs> so David Young E. Cho, uh, I'm sure if you're older in here, you've heard of him. Uh, so his, he had a little South Korean church. He grew up poor. He has some really neat books about operating in faith. Uh, and, uh, and his church grew to be about a million people uh, based on small groups, and literally about a million people. But in 1973, he um, started what he called the Prayer Mountain. And so there was a mountain that they bought that they started a, a prayer meeting on the top of it. And they started with night and day prayer at the top of this mountain. And uh, soon, like millions of people uh, per year would come to this mountain to pray. Now, the way they did it was kind of funny because you had these little cubicles you would rent and you would sit in this little box by yourself and pray. Like, so you got alone and you just, and you just prayed. And so he had this commitment to, to continue his prayer and he, he credited that with his church growth. His faith, the prayer, evangelism, and it, and it exploded. And our, our call that we feel as a church to have this time 
of prayer and worship really seems to be part of what God is doing on the earth today. This isn't that unusual to have a prayer room. As a matter of fact, if it's a larger church that's, that considers itself a river church or a spirit-filled church, it would be weird not to have a room or a time dedicated to prayer in worship, right? Some bigger churches, they have an actual facility dedicated to it. Others, like us, have a time dedicated to it. Uh, but it's kind of what God seems to be doing all over, all over the world, really. And there's many prayer movements, prayer organizations that are happening right now. Kind of the, the one that spearheaded it recently was um, in Kansas City with the International House of Prayer, which many people probably know of, uh, led by Mike Bickle. And they started... Um, they started, when did they start? In 1999. So they started a night and day uh, prayer in 99. Uh, actually, they started with a few hours a day, and eventually they went to 24 hours a day. And I think they've been doing 24 hours a day about 12 years now. Is that right? So they've been having, they, have, they have full worship teams and intercessors uh, who do this night and day, all day and all night. Now, we're not following anybody. We're following Holy Spirit. And so... Uh, IHOP, they, they, they feel like their call is very kind of closely linked to their eschatology. They believe that what they're doing is part of an end times thing, and, and uh, you know, that, that, that's great. We don't, we don't have that same urging, right? Like, that's, not, that's not the impetus for what we're doing. We're not trying to emulate anybody else. We feel like we are supposed to welcome Holy Spirit in this room, in our hearts at first, in this room and in this city. Amen? Like, we are supposed to give, up, give some earth that will yield to Holy Spirit, yeah. starting with the, with the earth that we have control over, which is ourselves. Yeah. Right? And so that's a huge part. We, like, he, he, Holy Spirit has to get a foothold on this planet, and it's supposed to be us. We are the beachhead of the move of God. Yeah. Right? So when he invades, they send, in the, the, they send in the invading army. The invading army takes a beachhead, right? Yeah. And then once they hold the beachhead, they try to move inland. We are the beachhead. We are made from the earth, right? Literally. And if Holy Spirit gets control over this earth and it's yielded, now all of a sudden he owns property on the planet, right? And if he owns enough, then all of a sudden he can set the rent. You know what I mean? If you drive around Boca Raton, you see all these investments limited signs. You see all these for rent investments limited, these yellow. Have you seen that? They buy so many along federal because now they can set the rent. If you own enough, then you get to decide what rent costs. You're not competing with anybody else. It's, it's smart business, right? We call it monopoly in most, right? You get a monopoly on something. If I own all the gas and I'm the only person you can buy from, I get to set the price, right? Right? Like now all of a sudden there's an economy of scale. And so what we want is we would like Holy Spirit to own most of the living property in Boca Raton. Right? Like that's what we would like. We would like Holy Spirit to have control over most of the living property in Boca Raton. Then all of a sudden Boca would begin to change greatly. Right? I, I bless all these people who think we're going to change the country through politics. Have fun being futile. You know? I hope, that, you know, I hope you don't get burned out trying that. The only thing that's going to change our country is a revival of religion in this country. It's people from the crack house to the White House actually living out a moral life. Right? That, that, if that doesn't happen, I don't care who's in any office, you are, del you are deluded if you think that's going to change anything. It's not going to happen. Right? If Holy Spirit doesn't have property there, I don't care who you put in it. Uh, Amen? Amen? And so, so we want to be the first, we want to be the beachhead. Like you, and so sometimes we do things that like, well, God, I feel a little weird doing a prophetic act right now, but I believe you're telling me to do it. And if I'm not going to do it in the middle of a prayer room, what, what, what do you actually own in Boca Raton? Right? At some point, someone's got to say, I'm willing to look weird for God. Like, I will be your sign and your wonder, Right? I will be a sign of wonder. So, <clears throat> so when we began this uh, journey recently, uh, myself, Corey, and Kellyanne, um, as, we, as we lead this uh, ministry, I began to pray and ask God. I said, I told him that we're going to figure out what we're doing and why we're doing it by the, actually, I just said by the end of uh, October. Like, we're going to get this figured out. We're going to do it. And so I started a project, praying through Scripture, and I, and I talked about how I, how I did all that in, uh, last week, began praying through Scripture, began seeking the Lord, began talking to people, 
uh, doing some research on, uh, on, on different things. And I, at one week I said, hey, I am, uh, want to hear the Lord about this prayer meeting. I would like, if anybody has a prophetic word tonight, I want you to email it to me. I said, Lord, the, tonight is a night. I need you to email it to me. And I got, I got two emails. And, uh, and I'll, I'm going to kind of share those with you real quick. <clears throat> the first one, <clears throat> uh, the first one, first person had a vision. It said, in the vision, they saw me standing with Jesus behind me, and he began to pour oil on my head. The oil ran down my head, onto my arms, through my hands. And I was surrounded by people who were praying here in this room. And uh, as they were praying, they were being anointed. Now, this was significant to me because if you remember last week, I had talked to to Corey and Kelly and said, hey, I don't have any vision for where this meeting is supposed to be going. I need you guys to get a vision for this thing. I need you guys to figure this out. And uh, month after month, they would come to me and say, I got nothing. Corey said, hey, I got a vision for the worship. I got nothing for the meeting. Kelly Ann's like, I'm not getting nothing. I'm not getting nothing about nothing. (laughs) Like, I'll help, but I I don't got nothing. And so the Lord had begun talking to me. Before I got this email, the Lord talked to me like, hey, you are, as the head of the house, you as a set man in this house, it is your responsibility to hear from Jesus and, and lead people. And if you remember last week, I talked about the, uh, the encounter uh, with the geese, right? And when the geese began flying in formation with me, just at arm's reach, flying with me, and the Lord had spoke to me and said, you know, this is how you are supposed to line up the church with where I'm going. This is your job. You can't pass this off on the other people. And so it's just like you can't allow anybody else to raise your kids. Like if you're not raising them, then we just call that bad parenting. Like nobody, nobody picks up the slack, right? Right. right? It's you or you have kids that don't get what they need, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. Um, and so the, the, you can't pass off certain things that the Lord has called you to do to somebody else, Right. Um, unless you're willing to step down and let them raise up somebody else. And that's not going to happen right now, okay? So the Lord began talking to me. So that was confirmation to me that, hey, he's anointed me to lead this vision. And as I lead the vision and light the house up, then other people will be anointed to be in this. Does that make sense? The second one, the second vision I got, oh, we're getting late. The second vision I got, um, uh, oh, here we go. Um, in the second vision I got that someone shared with me, uh, there were, we, were, we were worshiping in the room, and the angels came in to join our worship because of the purity of the worship coming from the room. Then people came in waves who were broken, and they were being set free. Oh, come on. And I'm all about that. How about you? People were broken. People were coming in waves and being set free. And so that's kind of the history of kind of like what prayer is happening and what God is doing here, how we are connected to a much bigger prayer movement. Um, And again, uh, people do it for different reasons, uh, but, you know, we do different things for different reasons. And we're doing this because we know that God is behind us doing this. And we want to fulfill what God has called us to do. We want to be good stewards of the vision that God has given us. So tonight I want to very briefly, then we're going to to worship. Uh, I want to talk about um, last week we talked about how we're supposed to pray this week, we're going to talk about what we're supposed to pray, and I have three scriptures I want to share with you. The first one is uh, Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus, and I quote this one a lot, Jesus says, If you, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this, this scripture, like, we are supposed to ask for Holy Spirit Amen. continually. Like, this is, a, this is a theme of what we do on Friday nights. So it's no, it's no surprise that this is one of the scriptures the Holy Spirit said is supposed to be um, prescriptive of how we pray or what we pray in the burning room. Because if we're not praying for Holy Spirit to come, then I don't know what we're doing here. Amen. If we're not being a conduit of the Holy Spirit, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what is. I, I teach this, this um, scripture often. I have gotten many, many, many people filled with the Spirit based on this scripture right here. I quote this scripture, and then I say, now we're going to pray, and he's going to fill you because he's a good father. And it it happens all the time. I cannot wait till I get to heaven and see how many people got filled off of this scripture. I am looking forward. I am looking forward to see that. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you've not received Holy Spirit, um, it's, just, it's time. Right? It's, it's like it's, it's time. It's like having a sun pass and stopping and paying the tolls. It don't make any sense. Why do I keep stopping? I feel like my walk, I keep stopping. Because you need the Holy Ghost pass. It's the express lane to Jesus. Spirit to spirit, amen? I'm in the express lane. Right? Y'all are still working on Morse code. I'm praying in tongues. I feel the pleasure of the Lord as I say that. <laughs> right? Folks, like, I'm not hearing God. You're sending smoke signals. You ever notice there's no way to send a smoke signal back from above? <laughs> Might want to pray in tongues. Amen? Shaba. Shakaba. Amen. Shaka. I don't know if I can pray in tongues. You ever try? I don't know, I can't do it. How do you know you can't do it? When was the last time you tried to pray in tongues? I'm sorry, what? See? See that? People say stupid stuff, they don't even know they're saying it. Like, you understand what you just said was really stupid, right? How do I know if I can pray in tongues? Why don't you try right now? What? That don't sound like no tongue I ever heard. Come on, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Come on. But I don't know. Well, do you want to? Yes. But I don't want to do it. I want him to do it. That don't make no kind of sense. God is spirit. He don't even have a tongue. Why would he need to pray in tongues to himself? That don't make no sense. I want him to do it for me. Why would he pray for you? What? You're going to talk to himself so you don't have to? What, is that? what does that even mean? I don't want it to be me. I want it to be God. What? I got to... How, do you, how can you be so stupid and breathe? Like, what? Can you imagine? God, I'm not going to pray tonight. I want you to pray for me. He's like, what? I'm good. What am I praying for? I'm good. I'm chilling. My... I pray that you will wake up and start praying in tongues. I don't know where all that came from, but. Amen. Get filled. We need to just have a message series. Get filled. And every week I'll just say that. Get filled. Get filled. What are you waiting for? Get filled. I don't know. I don't know. It's so hard to follow. Him. Do you pray in tongues? When's the last time you prayed in tongues for an hour? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Did you pray in tongues for an hour? Huh? What? What? Shaba. <clears throat> All right, so I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Christopher. You wake every day an hour early and you pray in tongues. You see something happen. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I feel a little dry. Wake up at five o'clock tomorrow morning and pray in tongues for an hour. And then do it on Tuesday, do it on Wednesday. Do it. I bet you but you won't feel so dry anymore. Oh, oh man, wow, it's so awful. You went to the cross, but you have to actually wake up an hour early. Ooh. Mm. You got the short end of that deal, huh? Oof. It's a rough life. Hallelujah. Amen. So the first one was, ask for the sending of the Spirit. I have no idea what half of that was about, but I hope if you have been fighting getting filled with some nonsense excuse that you would just get filled. That was all for you. Feel blessed that Jesus just wasted 10 minutes of our meeting for you. Amen. The second one, my wife is not happy. I love you, baby. I'm going to move on now. I forgot. She went on the front row. Christopher and Raquel's here laughing. That's normally where I get the correction. That's where I normally get the yellow light. And so I see where the normally the yellow light is a green light. So I'm just like. <laughs> but then I looked at the second row. There was the yellow light. I blew through that yellow light. Now I got red and blue lights in the back in the rearview mirror. <laughs> oh. 
Hooty hoo. Hooty hoo for Jesus. All right. So we're supposed to. <laughs> so. <laughs> ah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Ah, if you're visiting us tonight, welcome to the fam. All right. If you're watching this online, um, or a delayed teaching, be filled. All right. So the first thing we pray, we, 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 we pray for is for the sending of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? All right. The second thing Jesus told us to pray for, we find in Luke chapter 22. And he says, in verse 39, he says, He came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. So let me just say this real quick as a, as a side note. The, the, the writers of the scriptures said he went and prayed as was his custom. Like it was well known that Jesus was a man of prayer. Not, not, not only did he pray a lot, like we even know where he prays. He prays so often, we know where he's praying. Oh, you don't know where Jesus? He's probably on the Mount of Olives praying right now, right? Like, he's, like that's, he was a man of prayer when he was on the earth, right? And he was without sin, probably connected. He was, and he came out as, and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. Smart move. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray that you... When's the last time you prayed that you would not be tempted and that you would not enter into temptation? A lot of people... A lot of people dealing with a lot of sin issues in their lives. But we don't pray, Lord, lead me not... It's so important. He told us, this is how you should pray. Every day, lead us not in temptation. Keep me, Lord Jesus. You know I am weak and I get tempted... Keep me away from temptation. Pray that we would not fall into temptation. And, and what I believe the Lord is telling us here is that we're supposed to pray that we live holy lives. Yeah. Yeah. Holy Spirit comes and we live a life of holiness, yeah. that our lives are holy. Lord, keep us from temptation. We want to be holy living vessels for you. We love you, Jesus. And uh, I... Uh, <clears throat> I talked this last Sunday. I kind of made fun uh, of, of people who misinterpret the scriptures on alcohol to say that, you know, the people who say that you're not allowed to touch alcohol when that's not in scripture. And I knew that people were going to take that as a license to be a, a stinking drunk, as if it's okay to hang out and party and get drunk with your friends and Jesus don't mind. Jesus don't mind. Probably still go to heaven, but you're not going to be able to operate in the power God has called you to. Right? It's not like, you know, we could just throw away one bad doctrine for another bad doctrine. Look, he said it's okay to drink. And you know what? All my friends uh, that I love and know were telling me, hey, if you tell people it's okay to drink, then they'll use all kinds of excuses that it's all right to drink too much. I'm like, well, no. You have to manage your freedom. You have to manage your freedom. God has given you freedom. What are you going to do with it? You don't have to pray. Are you going to? You don't have to serve. Are you going to? You don't have to love. Are you? Well, actually, you do. You don't. You do. <laughs> It's, you know, that's, you know, I'm sorry about that one. That's, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not an optional one right there. Right? So, like, he's saying, okay, you know, alcohol is not, it's not sin. It's, wine, it's impossible for wine to be sin. It's, it's sin to be drunk. You can't argue that. It's sin to be drunk. It's sin to get drunk. He, Paul even talked about people who think they're, they're going to enter the kingdom, and, but they go to drinking parties. I mean, that's in the scripture, in the new covenant. I don't know how you dance around that. You can't dance around that. It's right there. We want to live holy lives. We can't live these dissected life. And the, and the challenge is in this day and age, there, you know, there was a time that you had to travel across the country, across the, the, the world to find a place where the anointing was present, right? Like there were just a few watering holes on the planet. Now it's not hard to find an anointed assembly. It's not, and so we start, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recognize what people have paid for this presence. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right, in the next, you know, in, in, the, next, in the coming weeks, uh, as we move through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, we're about to hit Ananias and Sapphira. What happens when you don't treat the anointing with care? And it's a warning for the church. What happens when you do not treat the anointing with care? Everything blows up, 
right? That's a short, that's a short. And so instead of asking God, please don't let everything blow up, just, hey, can you just keep me away from the thing that causes everything to blow up, right? Like, can you just help me out here? Let me say one more thing about that while I'm on this, and I'll probably say this on a Sunday, and so act like you didn't ever hear me say it. So the religious, the religious spirit says, uh, if women might make me lustful, they need to cover up. Jesus said, if you deal with lust to the point of it affecting your relationships, you probably should pluck out your eyes. That's what Jesus said. You might want to pluck out your eyes. Right, right, right. Now watch this. Jesus said that. He's like, oh, look at you, Jane, dressing like a hussy. I'm going to fall into it. He's like, oh, here's a knife. You, know, just, you don't want to see her anymore? I got a solution for that. Pluck your eyeballs out. Oh, I don't want to pluck out my eyeballs. And you better need to get a grip on your weaknesses. I don't I won't go down that road anymore. I'm not feeling encouraged about myself right now. I don't know what's happening. But we want to operate in power, amen? We want to operate in power. This isn't some religious, you know, fear of the devil and all that stuff. This is like, I want to operate in power. I want to be trusted with the Spirit. Our final scripture is in Matthew chapter 9. And uh, <clears throat> Matthew 9, 37, you can put it up. Uh, all throughout Matthew chapter 9, Jesus, he's, he's like the entire time, he's like teaching everywhere. He's preaching the gospel everywhere. He's healing the sick. He saw the people were distressed, the Bible says, and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. In response to this great need, Jesus gives a very clear instruction. He says, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And so we're supposed to pray for that he would send Holy Spirit, that we would live holy lives, and that he would send out laborers into the harvest. Right? We're not supposed to stand up here and say, you know, we're reaching people and all these other people aren't, you know, like some self-righteous thing. But we are supposed to pray that he would send out laborers. Lord, send laborers into the harvest. Lord, when you meet Jesus, you actually, you care about the things he cares about. You hate the things that he hates. And then you love people. You can't have an intimate relationship with Jesus without loving his bride. And then hurting for the people that he died for that aren't his bride yet. Right. And so we have to pray that people would go out. I think I get the worship team going up here and that we would, that people would go out into the harvest. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We're going to pray into the harvest. Pray. There's three scriptures. Did you get them all? The second one was holiness because we talked about pray that we would not fall into temptation. The third one was for the harvest. I'll stop for you, Duke, because I know you'll pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's the, that's the second teaching. Next week, we're going to finish this up. Are we good? Yeah. Do you still love me? Yeah. I mean, you have to if you want to go to heaven. Hallelujah. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to start playing some music here, and we're going to pray. Uh, we don't foresee a time in our Friday nights where we, like, we get a prayer direction, and we line up and we pray. Like, that we do that Tuesday mornings. We don't feel like that's what we're supposed to be doing. But we are going to corporately pray. Someone up here might be praying on a microphone, and you're praying in your own words there, right? And we might, like, have a half hour. That we say for the next half hour, we're going to be praying that the Lord would raise up harvesters in Boca Raton or Lord we pray that the Holy Spirit would fall where this thing is happening in Africa right and we say for the next half hour we're going to do this and so someone may pray for a couple minutes and then we go into worship but we're just devoting our heart during that time to interceding and praying amen does that make sense and so we're we're, we're kind of um we're finding our voice here 
Uh, we're going to let Holy Spirit do whatever he wants to do. We're not saying we have all the answers. We know everything he's going to do in the future. But this is, this is the framework of what we're doing. So they're going to kind of, they're going to begin playing behind me. And we're going to stand and we're going to begin to pray. And we're going to pray over these three things. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray, and we're just going to pray. You ready? We're going to pray that the Lord would send His Spirit. The Holy Spirit would have a home right here. Holy Spirit. Ah. Holy Spirit. In your own word. Holy Spirit, that you would come. That this would be a place that you could do whatever you want to do. That this would be a place that you feel at home. Holy Spirit. We yield to you in this room, Lord. We yield to you in this room, Lord. We pray that you would come that you would send your presence, you would send your power. Holy Spirit, Jesus, I pray that you would baptize us afresh in the Spirit. Pray that you would baptize us afresh in fire, Lord. Come on, lift your voice and pray. Lift your voice and pray. Use your words. Jesus, yes. Yes, a fresh baptism. A fresh baptism that you would pour it out right now, Lord. Crack the skies, Jesus. Crack the skies, Jesus. Crack the skies, Jesus. Jesus, you said, huh, you said that if we ask, Father would send the Spirit because you're a good Father. Father, you're so good, and we ask you now that you would send Ah, you would send the Spirit here. Send the Spirit here in Boca Raton. Send Holy Spirit to invade. To invade our house, invade our lives. That you would invade our lives, Lord. Shake out of our. Shake, come on, come on, we're going to wait. We're going to wait on it, come on. Ramban, that you would come. That you would come, Lord. That you would come, Lord. That you would come, Lord. Start in me, Lord. Have your way in me, Jesus. Right here in my heart. Right here in me, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Our voices rise. All oh, creation cries. Singing out in Yes, Lord, that you would send your spirit in Boca Raton, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you all praise. We give you all praise, Jesus. We ask you to come. Come in power. In, come in power in Boca Raton, Jesus. Come in power in Boca Raton, Jesus. We want the risen Jesus in Boca Raton. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Holy 